Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. If you missed out on our training week, our training session last week, here's a quick overview. So as, as a part of the Monarch sessions at Dodge and SMLI, we will tag Monarchs using tags from the Monarch Watch tagging program to support Monarch monitoring research. So today we are delighted to have Dr. Baum, the director of Monarch Watch, joining us today to introduce Monarch Watch's mission and their tagging program to understand the dynamics of the Monarch's spectacular fall migration through mark and recapture. So a little bit about Dr. Baum. She is not only the director of Monarch Watch, but also a professor in the University of Kansas at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology with a PhD in etymology. And she's also a senior scientist at the Kansas Biological Survey and Center for Ecological Research. Her research primarily investigates the effects of land use and management practices on pollinators with a focus on native bees and monarch butterflies. She has worked with monarchs and pollinators in the Great Plains for more than 25 years, participating in numerous state, regional, and national working groups to promote pollinator conservation. Dr. Baum's work in research and Monarch Watch are deeply interconnected. She tags monarchs as part of her research and has even created a monarch way station at her own home. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Baum. Thank you, Cynthia. So I'm, I am joining you today from Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, so on the uh, University of Kansas uh, campus. Uh, and I will share my screen. So uh, I am representing Monarch Watch. Uh, we have a, a team of people that work together um, on the three main components. Uh, so we focus on research, which is um, our tagging program is the center of that, but we also focus on education and conservation, which includes on the ground uh, restoration activities, um, in particular, getting more milkweed plants in the ground. Uh, so with that, um, I thought it might be interesting to kind of look at the history of tagging. Uh, so the Urquharts were the ones who started uh, tagging uh, monarchs, um, you know, with the idea of wanting to find out where they go for the winter. And if you look at that picture um, in the upper left corner, uh, at the very beginning of tagging, uh, you know, there weren't good adhesives and there wasn't a really good way to attach things to the wing. So if you look closely, you can see there's a little punch through the wing. So that way they could fold the tag over the wing and then it could um, adhere to itself, if that makes sense. So that was kind of the original uh, way that tagging worked. Um, and then I dug through our uh, notebooks uh, for different tags and we're actually probably going to put together a blog post kind of on the history of tagging just within Monarch Watch. But the, um, and can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the the little uh, white tags here uh, were the ones that they used uh, back in 1992, which is the year that Monarch Watch started and the first year uh, that they did the tagging. Um, and this was uh, uh, developed by uh, Chip Taylor, who's the, the founding director of Monarch Watch and who I just chatted with uh, earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, and so they were just uh, little uh, mailing stickers. Um, and so they printed on those tags. So those were from 1992. And then the ones that were color coded were from 1993. Uh, so it's interesting, if you look at the tags, they're a little bit more rounded. So the idea that the adhesive is going to work better if you don't have any, um, you know, as many corners as you would, you know, with a, a rectangle or square. But then, of course, we've shifted to the, the circular tags more recently. Um, and um, I think the very first year, so back to those white tags, uh, you know, they recommended that people kind of gently rub the scales off so that the adhesive uh, would attach to the wing. And actually looking through our taggy notebooks, uh, you know, I found a, a letter from a long-term uh, volunteer um, who's is still very, very active with us uh, from back in uh, 1992, where he's like, your adhesive does not work very well. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, you know, so it's a challenge to, to figure out how to, how to tag monarchs. So the 
uh, circular tags and then working with the company uh, to develop an adhesive that would um, go through the, the scales all the way to the membrane uh, to attach really, really well um, is, is what they ended up doing. And we do get uh, people contacting us about uh, being interested in tagging, you know, other types of insects. A moth seems to be one of the more frequent ones, but, you know, they have many more scales. And so it's... You know, uh -huh. Our, our tags would work well for them. But it's kind of interesting uh, looking at the history of tagging um, and how tagging has changed over, over the years, um, but it all relies on volunteers uh, and uh, people tagging, you know, monarchs um, all over uh, uh, the U.S. And we focus on the, the Eastern population. So there are some tagging programs that work in the Southwest and um, uh, in more of the Western uh, monarch population. Uh, but we have people, you know, all the way from Southern Canada um, down through the uh, full migration route that, that work on tagging. Uh, with the idea that we can track uh, where the monarchs go and learn more um, about about them through through the tagging. Um, and so these are some of the Urquhart data, uh, so some of the very early data on tagging, so pre uh, monarch watch in some cases. Um, and so originally, uh, you know, before they figured out uh, where monarchs were going, uh, they were getting re-sightings, you know, within the U.S. And we still get those domestic recoveries as well that we, that we report. But you can see kind of some of the, uh, you know, dots and, and lines that connect where a monarch was tagged with where it was, was re-sighted. Um, and so you can see the patterns um, over time. And then the uh, colonies are the um, in the sanctuaries in central Mexico uh, were found in 1975. So here's the cover of National Geographic from 1976 that shows what what some of those uh, uh, aggregations of monarchs look like on the overwintering grounds. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, the population size of monarchs, and so uh, when you try to estimate the size of um, insect, you know, that uh, covers a very large range, uh, it's very challenging. And so there's uh, been efforts to focus on the overwintering grounds where they're concentrated in one area um, as a way of being able to, to count the monarchs. And so, and I think I've got all this again in a minute, so we're going to uh, move, uh, skip forward a little bit. So here's a image that shows what it looks like on the overwintering grounds. So, uh, so they're in the oil mill, oil mill fir trees and the orange in the picture is, is monarchs, right? So then you have to figure out like, how are you going to count those monarchs? And so when we look at the overwintering numbers, they're actually estimated in hectares, uh, since most of the world uh, focuses on metric measurements. Um, and so, so it's an area, not numbers of monarchs, uh, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what, uh, what the numbers might mean as well. Um, and then this is what it looks like on the tree. So um, they call it shingling. So they're kind of overlapping or are layered on the tree trunks and hanging from the branches. So very, very uh, dense numbers of monarchs. And so there's been various studies over the years that have looked at trying to estimate, so how many monarchs are there per hectare? And so the most recent study was from a few years ago, and they looked at all the previous estimates and kind of came up with their best guess, uh, which is 21.1 million monarchs per hectare. Uh, so that's a, a lot of monarchs, uh, but not many when you think about, uh, you know, an insect and the, the long distance migration and, and all the hazards um, along the way. So uh, we'll go back to that original graph. Um, so um, again, hectares is going to be on the, the y-axis and then the winter season uh, in which they estimate the size of the monarch population is on the y-axis. So you can see the first year that they have good data is from 1994 and 95. So that was um, after uh, Monarch Watch started in 1992. Um, and so they'll they'll go out and they'll find uh, kind of the tree that's farthest upslope that's occupied by monarchs. And then they'll measure the distance and direction to the um, all the monarch trees around the periphery um, to come up with that, that area estimate. Um, and so you can see the population has um, fluctuated a lot over the years. Um, that's pretty common for insect populations uh, that use the strategy of, uh, you know, laying uh, many eggs. Uh, and so if you think about, um, you know, a female monarch, 
Um, you know, she can lay um, a few hundred eggs in her lifetime, but then you think about how many of those are going to make it to adulthood. And there's been various estimates, but it's in the, like, if you think of a hundred eggs, you know, only a handful, if you're lucky, are going to make it to be, to be adults. So there's lots of predators and lots of, of, um, of uh, challenges for uh, monarchs. Um, but that also means when there's a good year, um, and you have a good uh, more survive that the population can build up really quickly. So you kind of that's one of the reasons you see these big big fluctuations in the size of the population. And I will say, oh, maybe I can get over to the chat now. I was having trouble seeing the chat. Okay, um, with the uh, screen sharing as well. Okay. Uh, we're still good to go. Uh, so so uh, looking at those population size numbers over time, you can see there is a decline. Um, it's thought that um, the population size was was really high um, in the you know 80s and 90s. If you think about agriculture and common milkweed, um, you know the agricultural practices of of plowing, you might have actually helped. Um, helped the milkweed, you know, that does well with disturbance. Uh, but then when we had the advent of Roundup Ready corn and soybeans in particular in the upper Midwest, um, you know, where they're able to eliminate um, the milkweed from those crop fields um, is when we start to see um, a substantial decline in the population. Um, so uh, the petition to list monarchs uh, was submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in August of 2014. So that followed uh, the lowest population size on record, uh, which was recorded um, that previous uh, winter season. Um, and then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came out with an initial decision where they said the monarch uh, that listing was warranted but precluded. So what that means is they found evidence to suggest that the population you know, needed support from the Endangered Species Act, but that there were other species that were a higher priority um, or that uh, were in more immediate need of attention. But then they have to revisit that decision every year. Um, and then the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, put the monarch on their red list in July of 2022. Um, so originally they listed it as endangered, but then um, uh, they received additional questions from scientists. And so they revisited that question and they now list uh, the monarch as vulnerable, um, but that's not uh, related to the U.S. Endangered Species Act. So that's entirely uh, separate from uh, the U.S. listing. Um, but um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will come out with a final decision this December. So that so it's uh, you know kind of good timing uh, to talk about monarchs. Um, and so um, you know it's interesting if you think back to 2014 uh, when we had the lowest population size on record. Ten years later, we had the second lowest population size on record. So that 0.9 that we had this past overwintering season. Um, is the second lowest size on record, um, but it, the population actually seems to be doing pretty good. So there were very, very few monarchs that made it to Texas, um, but um, you know, there were some late cold snaps that maybe uh, killed off some of the predators. And so, um, so the population actually did really well and we had good numbers coming out of Texas. And so when that first generation is really good, uh, there's a good chance to, to, to um, uh, build up. Um, and I will get to the weight of the tags here in just um, just a minute. Um, and so uh, it's interesting um, the way uh, we receive tag recoveries is that the locals will uh, search through um, butterflies. To, you know, typically these are going to be dead butterflies on the forest floor um, and find tags. And then we have a lot of um, people in our network um, that some of those will visit the overwintering sites each year and they'll buy the tags from, from the locals. Um, but occasionally we'll get a picture, uh, which is what this one is here. Uh, so you can see the tag and the picture. Um, that was from uh, January 22nd of, of this year. Um, and the, the tags um, weigh about uh, two to three percent of the body weight of a monarch. Uh, there's some more um, high tech um, advances in recent years. Uh, there's solar tags now, but they're still really heavy relative to the size of a monarch um, and expensive. So those are more like, you know, about 15 percent of the body weight. So it's not clear that that wouldn't have uh, more of a negative 
um, effect on on monarchs. So so the the stickers are still you know kind of the best way to go um, in terms of being able to have uh, you know broad application across across a wide wide range. Um, and uh, so this shows some of the the um, tagging data over the years. Uh, so of course the program started out small, and so you're not going to be able to read all those numbers. But I guess the the highlight is that bottom right hand corner uh, where it shows we've had over twenty one thousand tag recoveries. Uh, so this has given us lots of good information about uh, where uh, monarchs are coming from um, and where they're uh, recovered at on the overwintering grounds. And so if you look across the top of that table, that shows different sites on the overwintering grounds. And so there's some of the main ones, um, you know, that they're they're located at where, where uh, most of the recoveries occur, occur from each year. Uh, so looking at the uh, migration for monarchs, uh, the overwintering sites in central Mexico are located down there. Uh, where the um, star is, the blue star. Um, and so some of the challenges for monarchs on the overwintering grounds have been uh, deforestation um, of those overwintering sites, um, but that there's been a lot of work in Mexico to, to limit that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that was, there's also bark beetle um, uh, damage uh, and other things that have thinned those sites that, that have created challenges as well. Um, but the, the graph kind of shows we've got the Western population of monarchs that will um, overwinter along the uh, coast of California. Um, and then um, I'm primarily focusing on the Eastern population, which is the one that migrates all the way uh, to Mexico. Um, but you'll see they come up through Texas um, and then a disperse. So the first generation will be in Texas, um, or the southern or western portions of some of those adjacent states, and then they'll expand from there. So a good year in Texas is good for the the overall population. Uh, and this also highlights the Corn Belt, which is where we see um, a lot of the production of monarchs occurring and also where there's been a lot of loss of milkweed. So habitat loss, um, pesticides, herbicides in particular are another challenge for, for monarchs as well. Um, another big one uh, would be um, warming temperatures. So one of the big cues for monarchs for the migration um, is temperature. And so when we have warming uh, conditions, the concern is that we could potentially lose the migration if they lose some of those cues that they uh, use to, to migrate. Um, and there are some monarchs that have been overwintering along the, the Gulf Coast, um, potentially related to, to, uh, to warming temperatures. Um, so just a kind of another view um, of what the the uh, migration looks like and where monarchs are um, in terms of the different generations. Um, and this uh, figure is from Journey North. So we get lots of good data from Journey North. If you haven't looked them up, uh, that's where you can submit uh, first sightings. Um, and they also have data in the fall. So you can, people can submit um, uh, roost sightings. Uh, so where there's aggregations of monarchs and trees as they migrate south um, or peak migration. Um, you know, or in the spring, you can submit your first monarch, your first egg, things like that. So lots of, of great data for scientists. Um, but you can see when we get um, here into July, uh, we're looking at the second and third generations. Um, and then, uh, you know, that third or fourth generation is the one that's going to going to migrate to Mexico. So the that generation, those adults will re emerge, uh, you know, migrate uh, through uh, the U.S., uh, through uh, Texas uh, down to central Mexico. And then those same individuals are the ones that come back um, in the spring, uh, lay eggs and, and then die in, in Texas. But then we have subsequent generations that will continue, continue north. Uh, so if we think about monarchs, uh, the life cycle varies a lot depending on, on temperature, um, but uh, they're going to be an egg for three to eight days. Um, and then a caterpillar uh, for another uh, nine to 14 days. Um, and then they'll be in the pupil stage, the chrysalis stage for eight to 15 days. And then the adults uh, will live anywhere from a few weeks in the summer if they're uh, reproducing, you know, up to six to nine months um, if they're the ones that, that migrate to, to Mexico. So for the larval stages, the eggs and caterpillars, uh, they're going to need milkweed. Uh, milkweed is their, their sole host plant. 
Um, and then the adults will need nectar. And we usually think about them being able to use a wide range of different nectar sources. So we haven't worried about nectar so much, but we think one of the reasons the population was so low this past year uh, was that there was a drought, you know, all the way from Southern Oklahoma down to central Mexico. So you know, if you do have a really extensive drought, then nectar can become more challenging. And that nectar is what they convert to, to fat that helps them survive the winter um, and then also uh, migrate north in the spring. Uh, so here is another uh, view of a monarch egg. Um, are a couple eggs on this plant, um, and then uh, eggs, and then a blow up of the egg. Uh, so it's not actually round. It's, uh, you know, kind of more of a um, oblong pyramid uh, type of shape, and it's got those little striations. Uh, so they're very, very distinctive um, eggs. Um, and we'll see if my videos work. I thought it would be uh, so when the eggs are about to hatch, the top turns really dark, so so black, and that's actually the head capsule of that first instar caterpillar. So you can kind of see its little mandibles poking out there as it chews. And then there's another one here that's kind of the side view um, of that little first instar chewing out um, of its egg. Um, and then that last picture over to the right uh, shows that uh, typically the first thing that first instar caterpillar is going to do is consume its eggshell. And so that gives it um, some extra nutrients um, and other things, but it's, but it's kind of interesting. So, so they turn black right before they're going to hatch. Um, and so you can see the, the uh, little first instars chewing out of their egg. Um, and then um, the way you tell the different instar stages apart um, if you look at the tentacles, the projections at the front and rear end of the caterpillar. Uh, so when they're first in stars and you can't see very well, but that the leaves over on the right hand side have all the life stages, but you won't really be able to see the projections at all. Uh, but then the second in star, um, you'll be able to start to see the projections, the little knobs uh, will be a little bit more pronounced. Um, and then the third in star, uh, the ones at the front will extend past the, the head capsule. Uh, fourth is bigger and then fifth is much, much bigger. So because they're caterpillars and, you know, their bodies are really squishy, you can't really go based on the size of the body per se. So we look at those uh, projections at the front and head end of the caterpillar. And then a lot of times they've got kind of distinctive uh, feeding patterns. Um, you know, they don't, um, the large ones will feed towards the edge of the leaf, um, but you know a lot of the early instars will uh, kind of consume uh, more towards the center of the leaf. Um, and so some different feeding patterns and different instar stages. So um, we've got a, a fourth instar over here, and I can't see very well on my picture there, but I'm thinking that's a second or third. Uh, I, I need a bigger computer screen <laughs> um, or maybe a third, but you can also see the frass. So the caterpillar poop, uh, we refer to as frass. So you can see that kind of grows. And a lot of times when you're out in the field looking for fifth in stars, you might see the frass before you see the caterpillar. So you can see this, this guy kind of hiding out over here, but you uh, can spot, spot its frass ahead of time. Um, and um, here's a few adults on flowers. So shifting kind of over to the adult stage. Um, and uh, the way you can tell males and females apart is the males have a scent gland um, on their hind wing. Um, they don't actually use that. Um, a lot of butterflies use that um, as you know, mate attractant, other things, monarchs don't, but they still have it there. And so it's a little bit hard to see uh, when the wings are folded up, if you looked at the, the dorsal side, the back side of the wings, it would be more obvious. And I've got some more pictures uh, coming up that show that. And so the female doesn't have that. And the uh, things of her wing are a little bit thicker, uh, but usually it's the presence or absence of the that scent gland, that uh, pouch or dot on the hind wing. That's um, how we usually look at them. Um, so here's some of the Journey North data. Um, uh, so that site I mentioned that you can uh, submit sightings to. And I pulled this maybe on Monday. Uh, so it's pretty recent. So it kind of shows you the, the distribution of monarchs that's been reported. Um, and they'll they'll switch out their um, 
there are graphs and the data you can submit, I think um, starting August 1st for the fall. So they'll, they'll have a change, but you can kind of look and see, uh, see where monarchs are. Let's see. And then um, when you order a tagging kit, um, this is what comes in the mail um, and we'll have a new, we actually just finished our tagging newsletter for this year. So we'll, um, we actually um, print it out and then we have a big, uh, you know, we have to stuff the envelopes ourselves <laughs> and we, we order our, a bunch of tags uh, from a, from a company we've been working with for years. Uh, so, uh, so there'll be a new, uh, this will be the first year that I will have provided the uh, the newsletter tech. So this one will be B from me, but, um, and there'll be a data sheet, um, but there's other ways to submit data as well. Um, and so the first question we always get with tagging is when do I start tagging? Uh, so it's, it's based on latitude. Uh, so I've got the latitudes uh, plotted out here on the map. Um, and so uh, based on your latitude, uh, we have recommendations on when when you can begin tagging. Um, and so the idea there is just make sure you're getting that migratory generation and you're not getting ones that might still be reproductive. Um, and typically most of the ones you're going to tag, you know, they'll be freshly emerged. Um, and so um, in, in particular, if you're rearing, um, of course, they'll be they'll be fresh. Um, and so so you can see the recommendation for tagging for when the migration will start. Um, and then we also have some recommendations on um, the website about peak migration. So when you would expect to see the most monarchs, which is also by by latitude. Um, and so, uh, and I guess you guys are somewhat close to, to 40 degrees north. So you would be down here, you know, early to, to mid-September um, as well. Uh, so when you might expect to see, see uh, the most monarchs. Um, and then um, journey north. So this is the peak migration data from last year. So you can kind of look and you might. Uh, so the, the thing I find challenging about reporting peak migration, right, is you have to do it after the fact. But I don't know that that's what, what people do on this site, right? So, so you're, you're, you're kind of making a, a guess at, as, as they come through on when that, when that might be. Um, and then this is the the fall roost data. Um, so again, that would be where there's, um, and you typically, um, I think we tend to see more fall roost as they move a little bit farther south, um, in particular when you get to grasslands where there's not as many places for them to stay uh, stay overnight. And so there, you know, f trees being few and farther between, uh, they'll um, uh, tend to uh, aggregate in some of those. Um, and then, um, it, so we've got the, the paper data sheet. Uh, we also have on our website where you can go and download an Excel file. And of course, we prefer to get either the Excel file or the, the app. Um, and then we also have the app where you can, can submit your tagging data. Um, and so there's, um, if you um, uh, get a chance to download the, the app, they actually have where you can even scan in your codes um, so that you don't have to enter your code for your, for your monarchs every time. Um, and location information and, and all of that. Um, but uh, but uh, so it kind of streamlines it, but then uh, you, you do have to have you know, your device with you or you could even um, enter it when you're done um, on, on a mobile device as well. Um, uh, but, um, and then just some other information that that will be on the app. Um, and I'll, I'll shift forward a little bit farther um, because we've got a little bit more information. So this would come with your tagging kit as well. But this is the the dorsal side, the when the you know butterfly has its wings spread out. And so you can see those pouches that the male has better. Um, I always kind of say they bleed through to the other side. It's kind of like you took a sharpie and made a dot, and it you know kind of you know when when you're looking at the underside, but you do get more more used to it uh, when you when you start tagging, and then the female doesn't have that that dot, um, and so that's what the the pouch looks like from the other side. Um, and then here's um, a view um, of a male and a female. Um, so the male is going to be on the left side. And again, it's a little tricky to see from the underside of the wing. Um, and then the female, you know, her veins are just a little bit thicker, but she doesn't have that little bulge there. Um, and then this is another one. Um, and this is a, a trick one. Both of them are males that you can see. So, <laughs> so, uh, so you can see that this one, I think is a little bit more obvious than the other picture. Um, and this one too. So you can see the, the, the pouch, the bulge. Um, so, uh, so those would both be males. 
Um, and then thinking about the placement of the, the uh, Monarch Watch tag, you place it on the discal cell. So, and we always call it this mitten shaped cell kind of at the center of the hind wing. Um, and uh, when they developed the tagging program, you know, Chip did some research to figure out like where can you place that tag where it's not going to negatively affect their their flight. Um, and so that was uh, was where uh, they identified as the best location uh, for for uh, the tag. Um, and so um, and this is a picture uh from uh, actually, so I moved to, to Kansas from Oklahoma State University. So this was in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, and this is one of the sites. Um, campus had these abelia bushes um, all over and, you know, all of those are, are monarchs. And so I haven't found um, as good of a location here yet, but where you can just go out and, you know, flop your net over and get a couple at a time. And like, uh, anyway, so uh and so as a researcher, um, I take a little bit of a different approach to, to tagging because I, I get more data for the monarchs. And so if you look over that upper right-hand picture, um, those are glassine envelopes. Um, they're kind of like wax paper envelopes So when you're collecting a bunch. So we would collect a bunch because we wanted to measure the wings. We wanted to weigh them um, and then tag them. Um, as, and we also would test them for a spore forming protist. Um, and so uh, it was easy for us to just collect a bunch, take them back to the lab, process them, let them go, you know, go collect some more. So that kind of was our, our process. So uh, so that would be um, uh, some that I had collected. And this... Um, picture in the top middle here gives you an idea of how wing size can be quite variable and that would be related to, to food availability um and um and also down down here when you look at the abdomen you can see one's got a, a much thinner abdomen compared to the other one so that's one of the reasons we like to measure the size of the wings um uh and we've got a particular if if you're interested i could send you um, some information that shows where we measure kind of from that dot to the edge of the wing to get length and then width um um, and then we we weigh them. So, you know, we'll just put them in, we'll weigh the glossine envelope and, you know, tear at the scale and then then put the, the butterfly in there. Um, and then you can see one tagged there as well. Okay. Um, and so this is just some data uh, from Oklahoma that I've collected over the years. Um, and so I put um, sample size at the top. So the, the number that we've been able to, to catch and, and tag. Um, so it kind of varies. 2020 was an interesting year. So um, when you think about the tagging data, it's when uh, monarchs are nectaring, right? So if they're flying high, you know, if the winds are good, if they're out of the north and they're pushing them south, you know, they might not stop to nectar. So usually if we're trying to figure out what's a good, good, day, you know, what, what are going to be the great days for catching monarchs? It's when the wind shifts and they come out of the south, you know, so then the monarchs kind of stall out and they'll drop down in nectar. So they're not fighting, fighting those winds. So it kind of varies, but I color coded my weeks um, to, to kind of give you an idea of how the migration shifts from year to year. So it depends on, you know, a lot of conditions, um, including the weather, you know, the wind, um, things like that. So we would usually say for the area I was at in Oklahoma, you would say peak migration would be at the end of these light uh, green bars. Um, but, and I will say, you know, the migration has been shifting a little bit later, you know, with warming temperatures that kind of delay, delay the migration, uh, but you kind of see how it shifts. So actually this uh, last year, 2022 was maybe the closest to kind of normal peak, peak time. Uh, so a lot of it being later, 2016, uh, quite late. Um, and so, uh, so kind of just when we, we collected uh, monarchs each, each year. Um, and then I've got the proportion female up there. So we, um, so the sex ratio for monarchs would typically be one to one, um, as you would expect for, for, uh, so it'd be 0.5, you would expect. Um, but you do tend to catch more monarchs that are nectaring, uh, than you would females, uh, just by the, the nature, um, you know, of how it works, um, and the timing. So you would just, um, just we tend to tag tag more males uh, than what you would see for females, just ba based on the ease of catchability and and the nectaring and things like that. So kind of interesting as well. Um, and so then this was um, weight. So I took average weight, and this is just 
the male migrants weight by week um, that I plotted over time. But you can see it does does vary um, uh, depending on on conditions and what what resources are are available. Um, so, but but quite substantially, uh, depending on the week. Um, and we also think about um, males tending to come through early. So we'll I'll, oftentimes we'll see see males earlier on um, in the migration throughout the entire migration, but just early on, it's more more male uh, focused. Um, and with that, I was going to highlight a few more things. Uh, we talked about uh, milkweed and nectar plants for monarchs, and we also have a way station program. Uh, so where you can create a habitat for monarchs um, uh, at your home or at your at your school. Um, and at the end of the year, um, we'll open up our some of our free milkweed programs. So we have a free milkweed for schools program uh, where you can apply and, and get some flats of milkweed. Um, we also have a free milkweed for restoration projects. If you've got larger scale projects where you want to add milkweed and all of those open up um, towards the end of the year. So you'd want to want to get your application in the, then. Um, and so we actually um, have people that um, collect milkweed seed for us and send it in. Um, and then we actually go out, we actually went, I'm trying to remember what today is, Wednesday, I think, uh, to collect some Asclepias virida seed, one that we don't tend to get many of for this eco region. So we'll, we'll want the seed to be from a particular eco region, and then we'll send it to nurseries. They'll grow it out, and we'll send the plants back to that eco region. So those plants are from from seed that was adapted to that that area. So um, so that's another one of our programs, um, and you can register your way station um, as well. Um, and we also um, do rearing kits uh, for schools. And so I, I was actually just over at the lab earlier. Uh, we, we do what we call isolating. So we have some breeding colonies um, in our facility here. Uh, so we'll have eggs that will, uh, when they, when this, you know, the, they turn black and hatch into the first instars, we'll use a paintbrush and we'll transfer them uh, to these little one ounce um I think they call them portion cups, but you know, kind of be like what you would get ketchup in, you know, at some some uh, you know fast food places, um, and then we'll we'll ship them. Uh, uh, we have this artificial diet uh, that we'll we'll ship them to schools uh, for uh, them to go through the the life cycle um, as well. Um, so those are some of the the other things we do, um, and for thinking a little bit more about um, tagging and some of your programs. Um, uh, for we do have a place on the data sheet to indicate if your monarch is wild caught or reared. And for rearing, um, we tend to not have as good of um, success rate on the from our recaptures of tagged monarchs that are reared. And so if um, if you think about you know what are really good conditions for reared monarchs, you want to make sure they're exposed to natural light you know, as much as possible, that they're never out of food. I, I will say it's hard to keep them with food <laughs> because, you know, once they get to the fifth in-store stage, they do they do eat a lot. You know, make sure you're cleaning out the, the containers. If you can keep just one per container, that's ideal. But I think, um, you know, some of the rearing practices, um, if they're competing for food or out of food at any point in time, or they're not getting all those natural daylight uh, temperature cues um, can, can affect uh, their likelihood of, of being able to make it to, to Mexico. So some other thoughts. Um, and I guess I would just end, you know, we kind of view monarchs as a flagship species, you know, so monarch habitat is good habitat for a whole lot of other animals as well. And it's pretty easy to add in other animals, depending on what you're interested in. Um, like one example would be um, quail forever, pheasants forever does a lot for monarchs because good monarch habitat is also good quail habitat. Uh, you know, so, so there's lots of, of support from, from a lot of, of different groups. Um, you know, so they're an, an important part of the the food web, um, you know, in terms of pollination and uh, biodiversity and, and contributing, uh, you know, there's lots of things that, that they're distasteful, uh, but lots of things that also eat monarchs, at, at especially um, those early um, instars. Um, and, uh, you know, we also think about the importance of monarchs to people. I always say they're they're a great connector. You know, so many people have a, a monarch story, um, you know, of, of why they're they're important. And so, you know, we hope with the the rearing kits, you know, every kid uh, gets a chance to 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 see see monarchs as well. Um, and then certainly, you know, thinking about in in Mexico, um, we always um, uh, 
monarchs are associated with Day of the Dead. And that's because we always think of them ideally, you know, they reach the overwintering sites, you know, on the Day of the Dead. So, you know, uh, the very beginning of, of November. So that's kind of where that that connection comes through because uh, it connects very closely to their life cycle um, and their arrival on the overwintering ground. So um, let's see. So there was a question about um, if they um, harm the trees um, and they don't, but it is actually interesting. Now I'm wondering, you know, how much, how much weight is that? Uh, you know, each individual one doesn't weigh very much, but when you add, add uh, thousands, uh, you know, they, they could be, be quite heavy, but I um, have not heard of any, any negative um, impacts on the trees. And it's also interesting. You kind of think of the colonies in Mexico kind of being in one location, but they do actually shift and move some over the winter. Uh, so if it warms up enough, they'll kind of all move down to um, like watering sources. So they don't necessarily stay in the exact same trees per se. They can shift and move and kind of ebb and flow a little bit on the overwintering ground. So it's, uh, they're not, uh, not entirely static, if that makes sense. So, um, um, uh, and um, I think I already talked a little bit about the the weight of the tags, uh, you know, being you know kind of that two to three percent of the body weight. Um, and they're um, I think last year was the first year they they used some of the solar tags, but again, you know, they're a much bigger percent of the weight um, and very expensive. So I don't think they've had many that have made it made it far. And it also relies on I think lots of um, of MOTA stations uh, that that aren't available either, but uh, but yeah, so lots lots of interesting um, interesting uh, future research with monarchs as well. So, are there more questions? If there are no more questions, then we have um, a little Kahoot activity. If you guys don't know what Kahoot is, it's uh, a little online quiz competition style um kind of games. I'm pretty sure many of you have played in played it in school already. So um oh I also want to mention that Monarch Watch also like has a lot of amazing programs like Dr. Baum said the um the monarch way stations. So if you want to like start your own monarch way station or native plant garden, you could always um, reach out to Raju or me because Three Wild had the community gardens program and we help fund um, gardens at schools. So um, if you're interested in that, that's definitely something you could reach out to us about. So are there any more questions? Okay, so if you have any more questions, you can always pop them in the chat. But now I we could start the who. Please join using the code on the screen. I'll also put um oh yeah, it just says join at. I'll put that in chat. Okay, we have 12 questions, I believe. So the first question is, what is the purpose of the Monarch Watch tagging program? One, mass rearing monarch butterflies to bolster their population. Two, studying the impact of predators on monarch survival. Three, understanding the dynamics of monarch migration through market and capture. Or four, Mapping monarch habitat to identify key areas for conservation. Okay, oh, hey, most of you got it. That's great. Second question, true or false, the monarch butterfly population has declined 80% or more since the 1980s. If you haven't joined yet or you got kicked out, you can always join with the game pin at the bottom. Okay, great.
which IUCN red list category are monarch butterflies currently in? This one's tricky because they changed it from, so it's different now. Yep, it's vulnerable, and, but they will review their status in December as Dr. Bong said, so we'll know if um, they'll still be vulnerable or endangered or some other um, category. Which is a cause of the monarch population decline? Poaching, pesticides, deforestation, climate change. There are multiple answers to this. Right answers. Okay, yeah, everything is right, except for poaching. Although um, some states have banned it because monarchs are have become vulnerable, but these are the three main factors. Okay, so is the monarch butterfly on the right male or female? So you have to look at the picture. Okay, it's male because um, it has the two little coaches as Dr. Bong said. Okay. Where do Easter monarch butterflies spend their winter? Canada, US, Australia, Mexico. Yep, yeah, Mexico. Uh, which egg belongs to a monarch butterfly? So you have to look at the picture for this one. One, two, three, or four. Yep, most of you got it. It's three. If you're curious about what the other ones are, this one is a uh, viceroy butterfly. This one's white cabbage, and this one is black swallowtail. And you can see this one's a monarch butterfly because it has a kind of oval shape with the little vertical um, lines. Which instar stage is this monarch caterpillar at? So you have to look at the image for this one too. One, two, four, or five. The clue is to look at whether there are projections on the caterpillar. Yep, it's one because um, at the first instar stage, the projections haven't grown out yet. Okay, monarch larvae or caterpillars only eat which plant? Grass, coneflower, parsley, or milkweed? Oh, all of you got it. Where do you place a monarch watch tag? Onto the pouch, the dot on the hind wing that differentiates male or female, center of the hind wing on the discal cell or the mitten shaped cell, or on top of the abdomen. Yep. 
Yeah, it's the um, center of the hymen on the discal cell, the mitten shaped cell, which is this one over here, because it kind of looks like a mitten. Connor's in the lead. Okay. Um, around how many tag monarchs have been recovered in Mexico? 200, 2,000, 20,000, or 200,000? Yep, it's 20,000. Okay, last question. Why are monarch butterflies important? They serve as a food source. They represent cultural symbols. They contribute to biodiversity. They pollinate flowers. All of them are correct. Okay, let's see. The leaderboard. Third place, we have Ryan. Second place, Connor. In first place, Max. And for fourth and fifth place, we have Bella and Eugene. And also congratulations to everyone else.